you filled out your census form yet? Millions of Americans have returned the 10 question survey. It only takes a few minutes to complete. But there are a large number of people out there that are refusing to return this form. Some Republicans have been complaining that the census is an invasion of privacy, that the government just asks way too many questions. So they've been out there encouraging people to ignore the constitutionally mandated form. And a wing that Michelle Bachman of Minnesota is someone that's been especially vocal. Well, the census, I'm saying for myself and for my family, our comfort level is we will comply with the Constitution, Article 1, Section 2, we will give the number of the people in our home, and that's where we're going to draw the line. Well, that was Bachman fueling the fears about the census on the ever so fair and balanced Fox News. But thanks to their own fear-mongering, the anti-census fear movement is growing, and now the GOP is getting a little bit worried. Because if people actually don't return the form, it could cost those lawmakers their jobs. You see, the number of House of Representatives members in each state is determined by population. So if you don't fill out your census form, then you don't get counted, and then your district could be redrawn, and some lawmakers could be out of their jobs. So all of a sudden, the GOP has decided that, in fact, the census is very important. So you want to know who they've called on to save the day? Oh, just good old Carl Rove. If you've not yet mailed back your 2010 census form, it's not too late. Please answer the 10 easy questions. They're almost the same ones Madison helped write for the first census back in 1790. Wow, so it turns out that the census questions being asked today are very similar to the first ones asked back in 1790. Well, if that's the case, what's all the hype and fear over this year's form? Oh, I get it. I think that's because it's a Democratic president's government that is asking those questions, right? Ooh. Now, if you ask me, it's just another political ploy by the party of no, trying to score political points to stir up the GOP wing nuts. So it's a good thing that they at least have Karl Rove to save the day and make sure that people like Michelle Bachman get to keep their seats. Lucky us. Now, have you heard of a $3.87 trillion lawsuit against the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission Chairman, Marielle Shapiro, as well as several other current and former SEC commissioners? Probably not. It's presented as the largest fraud case in world history, and it's happening right here in the U.S. But nobody is bothering to talk about it. Now, I'm going to give you a key statement here of the case. They say that during the period of June 1st, 2004 through October 28th, 2005, a total of 2.25 trillion phantom shares of CMKM Diamond Inc. was sold into the public market through legitimate brokers, illegitimate brokers, and dealers, market makers, hedge funds, ex-clearing transactions, and private transactions. Now, the sales of the majority of such shares were at all times known to the Securities and Exchange Commission, including defendants. So according to this lawsuit, the government then used CMKM as a covert sting operation unbeknownst to the company's estimated 40,000 shareholders to try and find the criminals. But we don't even know if they were ever apprehended. We'll discuss it with me. I have Tim Borello from the Manhattan Headlines Examiner joining me from our studio in New York. Uh, Tim, thanks so much for joining me. You know, this really is a very complicated case. I, I was sitting there trying to, uh, to figure it all out. Can you really break down some of the details for us here? What's to be gained? What's to be lost? Sure. What's happening here is that there are many shares. This is what's called a Bivens, action, Bivens class action lawsuit, which basically is a type of case that is upheld under a 1971 Supreme Court ruling that allows private citizens to sue federal officials in a personal capacity. So one thing to point out immediately is that this lawsuit is not against the United States Securities and Exchange Commission per se. It's against the individuals that are actually running it. And what is being presented in the lawsuit is allegations that a uh, sting operation was essentially set up using this company, um, using characters that were known within CIA and FBI circles, Bob May, who, who is a lawyer with roots in the CIA and FBI, to use a sting operation to basically entrap criminal wrongdoers that were selling unregistered shares of stock to people who thought that they were actually buying real shares. There's evidence suggesting within the public domain that anywhere from uh, 259 billion 
Shares were sold unregistered in a couple of hundred transactions through one broker named Daryl Johnson, or Anderson uh, Johnson, I believe. And the SEC has also acknowledged itself that over a 20-month period, um, as much as 622 billion unregistered shares were sold. And so there's a lot of different elements of what's going on here. The allegation is also that through the Sting operation, in a meeting in Las Vegas, essentially a whole bunch of criminal wrongdoers were brought together and they were given an option. Pay us amount of certain amount of funds based on the number of unregistered shares that have been sold and we won't prosecute you. Now, some evidence that is within this lawsuit and per the filing attorney, uh, Al Hodges, he says he has a witness who was in that room. They say they can prove that two point, up to 2.25 trillion unregistered shares have crossed over the markets. And ultimately, if these, you know, if these allegations can hold up in a court of law and evidence can be presented to show it, then there's going to be serious issues because what's happening here? Why did the SEC use a company to entrap wrongdoers when people were investing in it, regardless of whether or not the company was a fraud? The SEC is there to protect investors. And when people are putting their money into stocks, they have a right and a need to know that their money is going where they say it is. Now, you know... Um, if this really is the largest fraud case in history, as you were saying, then how come I haven't heard anything about it? Why is nobody else talking about it? That's a good question to be asked. I mean, to be fair, again, the, the one outlet that has touched this is the New York Times. Uh, not much coverage, though. Floyd Norris is their, uh, one of their head correspondents for Wall Street, and he's written about this in the past. And he has actually since covered the case uh, in March. But the way he's covered it isn't necessarily fair. And within his latest article on it, he even admits to being almost an SEC sympathizer. So from that perspective, how can you really you know, understand that he's giving this an objective look when he says he's more inclined to believe the SEC? Um, I think also other people that have looked at this that call themselves journalists or bloggers or whatever, they're overlooking the critical points of this case, which is basically that money was collected, you know, pursuant to crimes that were committed in exchange for immunity, and that the SEC has allegedly collected those funds. The shareholders are led to believe that that money was meant to be for them, and that those funds are not being distributed. And they're making the, you know, the assumption that in line with the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution for personal property rights, they're being deprived of their personal property. They have a claim here. So what's, gonna, what's really important here and critical is how the individuals named in this lawsuit, the defendants, how they're going to respond. Most likely, I would assume that they'll go for a motion to dismiss based on lack of merit, lack of evidence, whatever. But if this does go to a discovery process in a trial and the, the plaintiffs are you know, able to come forward and produce evidence backing up these claims, that presents a whole can of worms for investors everywhere. Because if it's true that the Securities and Exchange Commission has allowed, you know, a sting operation to operate within a company that people thought was real, that was publicly traded, the question there is, is this still happening and can it happen again? Uh, yes, that was, that's very interesting. I'm sorry, I was listening so intently because there are so many details in this case. Uh, well, I would like to definitely keep following this story and hopefully we'll get to talk to you later on about it. Thanks, Ted. We're going to take another break, but don't go anywhere. When we get back, we're going to have a live report from our New York studio on UN Resolution 1540. It requires governments to beef up their efforts to prevent terrorists from acquiring weapons of mass destruction. But a large number of governments haven't done their jobs.